Today is the fourth Sunday after Easter here in Tannersville, Pocono Mountains, Pennsylvania. The epistle is taken from St. James. Chapter 1. Dearly beloved, every best gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no change, nor shadow of alteration. For of his own will hath he begotten us by the word of truth, that we might be some beginning of his creatures. You know, my dearest brethren, and let every man be swift to hear, but slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man worketh not the justice of God. Wherefore, casting away all uncleanness and abundance of malice, with meekness receive the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. The Holy Gospel. From St. John chapter 16. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, I go to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? But because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is expedient to you that I go, for if I go not, the paraclete will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you, and when he is come, he will convince the world of sin and of justice and of judgment, of sin because they believe not in me, and of justice because I go to the Father and you shall see me no longer, and of judgment <clears throat> because the prince of this world is already judged. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of Truth, is come, he will teach you all things, all, he will teach you all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever things he shall hear he shall speak, and the things he shall speak, and the things that are to come he shall show you. He shall glorify me because he shall receive of mine and shall show it to you. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. So this summer, at the last week of June, there will be the St. Ignatian Retreats for the Ladies, last week of June, in Soldier, Kansas. And you can uh, see the, you can sign up on the thecatacombs.org or the SSPX Marian Corps. <clears throat> the information is there. And the men's Ignatian Retreat will be the first week of July. First week of July for the men. Father Ruiz will be coming to help preach the, the old St. Ignatian Retreats, condensed from 30 days to one week so that uh, the, lay, the laymen may come and be able to make these retreats. In the old days, people would make one every year. Priests are supposed to make one every year. We all need that to recharge our batteries, to refocus on heaven, to see the weeds in our soul that we have to pull out, and to beg God the grace. And with the retreats come many graces, <clears throat> many powerful graces that our Lord wants to give. So I encourage you to <clears throat> consider this and by all means make every effort to make the retreat. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the feast of a number of saints. St. Peter Chanel, who was a great missionary to the Pacific Islands, and also St. Paul of the Cross, and it's also the feast today of St. Louis de Montfort. So I'd like to speak about him because he's very per pertinent to our times. St. Louis de Montfort was a great promoter <clears throat> of the Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He promoted the consecration of each one of ourselves body and soul, to make ourselves slaves of Mary. 
Now, we Americans, that's the one word that Americans hate, is slaves, because we're the land of the Masonic freedom. But Catholic freedom is understood correctly. The satanic freedom of the French Revolution and the Freemasons is, I don't need to obey anybody, any ideas, any thoughts, any creed. I do what I want. I am slave of no one. We, the people, are the voice of God. And all that is condemned by the church and is condemned by common sense. And if you look at the history of the French Revolution, look where this false liberty led to. Tons of decapitations by the guillotine and a severe persecution <laughs> on all those who w wanted to stay faithful to the Catholic government and to the Catholic way of life. <clears throat> Needless to say, the Declaration of the Rights of Man was written and inspired by the Freemasons themselves, and it was condemned by the Catholic Church, by the great popes who condemned the errors of the French Revolution. But these errors exploded in Vatican II. Vatican II, as one of the cardinals of Rome said, Vatican II is the French Revolution within the Church. And ever since, they've been guillotine, guillotining traditionalists and the so-called Lefebvreists. They've been taking them to the guillotine and chopping their heads off and then trying to make agreements with, with them to get them to accept little bits of, you know, you can say your Latin Mass, but you've got to accept that it's legitimately promulgated. You can accept the, uh, keep preaching against modernism, but you've got to accept Vatican II. So the devil and the, the wolves of Rome, as Archbishop Lefebvre called the modernists in Rome, you don't shake hands with them until they profess the faith. And this is something we expect from our Catholic bishops. We can expect from our bishops the Catholic faith and publicly, publicly preached. It's not enough that they privately hold this opinion or hold that opinion. They must publicly hold the Catholic faith, that's their, that's their simplest basic duty, is to profess the Catholic faith publicly. So that's why uh, we can ask that of, our, of these bishops and bishops of Archbishop Lefebvre. We ask them to be stay faithful to tradition and stop preaching and making uh, deals with modernist Rome. And stop uh, betraying our Lord this way. And those bishops of Bishop Williamson, we ask simply... Preach the faith the way Archbishop Lefebvre did, which means condemn Vatican II, condemn the New Mass, condemn the errors that have been promoted about the New Mass, New Mass miracles, New Mass nourishes your faith, etc., etc. We, ex we, Archbishop Lefebvre, said that the faithful have a right to know where their bishops and their priests stand. You have a right to know, and it should be very easy for us to state publicly our position and my position is i want to stay faithful to the position of all the popes of tradition of archbishop lefebvre and what he commanded which was don't make any false agreements with modernist rome until rome comes back to catholic tradition and we know rome is far from catholic tradition now far it's in the grips of the freemasons the jews and the enemies of christ so what do we do? We keep fighting and we pray for Rome to come back to tradition. We pray that God will give us a good Pope who will restore Catholic tradition and consecrate Russia as Our Lady asked at Fatima. And she asked something very simple and be so easy to do. But the modernist Popes, they, they continue to kick, kick Our Lord and Our Lady in the teeth. And and push the heresies and the errors of Vatican II in the New Mass, which has taken many, many souls into perdition. So this is why St. Louis Mary de Montfort is, uh, is a powerful saint for our time, because he came, he came before the French Revolution. He was born in 1673. And he only lived 43 years old as a priest. And he died in 1716. 
He went to the same Jesuit college in Rennes, which is in northern France, which interestingly is was um, the same seminary where St. Isaac Jogues and St. John de Brebeuf went to school to be training as priests. So they had the good formation of the early Jesuits. And St. Uh, Saint Louis de Montfort, as a young priest, he was very moved to preach the faith to the poor children to the, who were de pretty much destitute. And he would preach to them the catechism and teach them the sign of the cross and teach them devotion to Mary. <clears throat> he would gather a group of girls who uh, he would found an order of nuns called the Congregation of the Daughters of the Divine Wisdom, who would be women of prayer, but also take care of the poor, and especially the sick. He would preach often devotion to Mary, devotion to the Mother of God, and he would preach the Rosary, very much the Rosary. So the Jansenists, that were pretty much entrenched in France. They hated him for preaching devotion to Mary. Remember the Jansenists, the Jansenism is Calvinism within the Catholic ranks, and it infected France terribly. So what would a Jansenist think? They would think, well, I can't go to communion because I've committed some, more, some venial sins. But the church doesn't teach that. The church says, if you've committed venial sins, you can go to communion. Just make an act of contrition. And it will be forgiven. Obviously, with mortal sins, we cannot go to communion. We need to go to confession. That would be a sacrilege. But the Jansenists took it way too far and said, to go to communion, you have to be perfect in your spiritual life. So, since nobody's perfect... <laughs> And all of us are trying to become saints and working to pull out the weeds of sin. Nobody went to communion anymore. And the Jansenist priests would always preach the justice of God, the anger of God, the punishments of God. And only this, so that people were just swallowed into a great despair of treating God, seeing God as only this hateful, avenging entity rather than the love of the heart of Jesus, burning with love for souls, who really died for us and suffered so much for us, and stays with us in the most blessed sacrament, and feeds your souls personally with his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist, and personally washes away your sins in confession. When you and I kneel down as penitents in confession, when the priest gives the absolution, the blood of Christ washes over your soul, making your soul brighter than the sun, whiter than snow. And this is very personal because our Lord cleans it by his power and his grace in the soul. And Catholicism is nothing more personal. The Protestants, when they get carried away with their hand clapping and, and their personal testimonies about how Jesus saved me, well... That's all, that's all loud noise. It's all cacophonic human sentiment and emotion. Catholicism brings the true personal touch, if we could put it that way, with God. Because in the Mass, God comes down on the altar. And you adore Him on our knees. The same living God who is in the glory of heaven. The same Christ who was born in Bethlehem who lived 30 years, who died on the cross and rose from the dead and appeared glorious to his apostles and rose, ascended into heaven, that same Jesus Christ the King will be very soon on this altar. And not only that, he will come to you and give you his own burning heart to, for you and I to receive. <laughs> what could be more personal and more loving and more tender and more close than this, this intimacy with God himself. And this is the beauty of Catholicism, with all the false religions don't have. They all despise the Holy Eucharist and reject it. But the Holy Eucharist is the excess of the love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. 
And this is something the Jansenists, <laughs> they would never preach, the love and the mercy of God. And we all need to be reminded, especially today when you've got, you know, Pope John Paul II and Pope Francis and all the modernists who are all about the mercy of God, the mercy of God, the mercy of God, again, and everybody goes to heaven, doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter what you do anymore. And out of Pope Francis' mouth comes the scandalous phrases like atheists go to heaven, Jews go to heaven. If they're not repentant, sodomites go to heaven. That's not true. Read the, read the words of Christ. The, those given to uh, idolatry, those given to uh, adultery, fornication, those who give it themselves to the love of the lie, they will be excluded from heaven. The effeminates, that is the sodomites, will be excluded from heaven unless they repent. So what the good popes would be saying today is you have to repent from your sin and abandon the dark works of darkness and come to confession and receive the state of grace and stop living in the life of sin instead of encouraging them to live in the life of sin. So today we do need to hear God's justice, but we also need to hear of his mercy. God is infinitely just. He's infinitely merciful. And thank God that his mercy outweighs his justice. <laughs> that is true. His mercy outweighs his justice. So, so St. Louis de Montfort, he would preach the love and mercy of God. He would preach the tender devotion to the Virgin Mary. And the Jansenist clergy hated him for this. So they persecuted him. And they would com complain to the bishop. And the bishop of Poitiers basically forbade him to preach. And bishop after bishop would punish St. Louis de Montfort because the bishops too were infected with the Jansenism. So finally he would go to Pope, he'd make a pilgrimage to Rome and visit Pope Clement XI. And the Pope would tell him, bless his work and say, try to work with bishops who will help you and work together with you. So... St. Louis de Montfort would go back to his home county, Brittany, his home part of France, and he would gather the people to, to bring their irreligious books, to bring them to be burned. Today we would need a burning of videos, a burning, a burning of, of videos and bad videos and bad books. All this needs to be done again. He would do this. He also um, would put an effigy of the devil on top of the, near the fire, and people would bring their bad books and have them burned, and then throw the devil into the fire. He would uh, inspire them by his missions to rebuild dilapidated churches, and he picked up a, a custom of re putting up the crosses as monuments. And he would build crosses. And, and in France today, many there's actually a movement going on in France right now, led by young people, to restore the, the roadside crosses that always used to be all throughout France. Crucifixes and little shrines of Our Lady. All these are being rebuilt again. There's a good movement doing this in France of young folks. So that's a very good thing. And this is something we need to spread throughout our country is roadside crucifixes roadside shrines in mexico you see them everywhere and in once catholic countries you see them everywhere so saint for saint louis de montfort he encouraged these roadside crosses and in one case he asked the people who were devoted to mary he didn't want a professional construction crew that were paid to come in. He didn't want that. He wanted the people of the parish themselves to shovel the dirt, to make a huge hill that would be called Calvary. And on top of it would be Jesus on the cross and Mary and St. John and St. Mary Magdalene. And he would all have all these trees and flowers set up to the glory of God. And the bishop who received bad reports against St. Louis de Montfort, he ordered him to remove it. 
And see, Louis de Montfort, after all that work and all that labor and all that the people gave to do this, the bishop ordered it to be all taken down. So St. Louis de Montfort, he saw, he wasn't angry. He would just peacefully accept the will of God. And he, he took it as, as, Saint, as Job of the Old Testament. God, blessed be God when he gives, blessed be God when he takes away. So that bishop, he's probably burning in hell, but that bishop, <laughs> he succeeded to have it all bulldozed and flattened. <coughs> but in the hearts of the people burned a great love for the Virgin Mary, thanks to St. Louis de Montfort. And uh, he would preach, of course, the power of the rosary. On one occasion, when traveling in a, in a market boat between Rouen and Dinant, he asked his fellow travelers who were singing obscene songs to join him in the rosary. Twice they answered his invitation with jeers and laughter. But eventually they not only recited the rosary reverently on their knees, but also listened attentively to the homily with which followed it. Another time he was on a, a ship and... The pirates, there were wild pirates that would just roam the sea and attack other boats, burn them, and take all their, <coughs> all their wealth, all their possessions, and leave them dead or with nothing. So on one of these ships he was in, the pirates saw his ship, and they, the, pilot, the pirates were started uh, rowing towards their ship to surround them and and brutalize them and saint louis de montfort told everybody in the ship let's pray the rosary pray the rosary our lady will protect us and they started praying the rosary <coughs> and the ship of the pirates kept coming closer and closer they could almost see the whites of their eyes and then our lady stepped in and the winds changed and the winds pushed them far 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 back so they never succeeded to do any harm there were many Calvinist strongholds in France that persecuted St. Louis de Montfort. And you would also found uh, a group of priests called the Missionaries of the Company of Mary. Yeah. St. Louis de Montfort, he would die a, a holy death. <coughs> Here's the account of his death. St. Louis de Montfort exhausted his great physical strength in his apostolic labors. On his deathbed in St. Laurent sur Sèvre at age 43, so he was very young, a young priest, he kissed the crucifix and a statue of the Blessed Mother. Apparently speaking to the devil, St. Louis de Montfort explained, In vain do you attack me. I am between Jesus and Mary. I have finished my course. All is over. I shall sin no more. Then he died peacefully on April 28th, which is today, in the year 1716. His feast day is today, the, the day of his birth into heaven. So a lot of his writings were hidden, and his book, True Devotion to Mary, which every Catholic should know well, <coughs> True Devotion to Mary was hidden for a hundred years. And it was found in a, in a wooden chest in some attic many years later of a priest who had died who was a Montfort priest. And digging in his papers, they found this book, True Devotion to Mary. And it became very popular. And the True Devotion to Mary has spread. And thanks to St. Louis de Montfort's influence, the he especially the people the peasant people the farming people the down-to-earth people of france in the vendee region received saint louis de montfort and loved <coughs> loved this priest and they adopted the prayer of the rosary and devotion to mary and consecration to mary 
So no wonder when the French Revolution exploded in 1789, <coughs> and when the when the the new government of the Republic cut, cut, chopped off the head of King Louis the Sixteenth and killed his family in cold blood, within a few years they'd be marching with the infernal columns to the Vendée. The Vendée region, all the, all the men rose up and fought and battled against the armies of the French Revolution. And these armies were, you know, well paid in nice uniforms, nice drums, trumpets, nice polished rifles and cannons. And the Vendée Catholics would go to war, some of them with just clubs of broken off of a tree, their hoes, their axes, rocks. That's what they went to war with. And they won. They started winning many battles. And then the, the Masonic powers in Paris said, we have to crush the Vendée, crush them with no mercy. Some argue this was one of the first genocides. And they sent what was called the infernal columns that went and burned their fields, killed every animal, every baby, every child, every mother, grandma, grandpa, dads, moms, boys, girls, all of them. <coughs> and in near Nantes in the River Loire, they would, they would um, tie sometimes priests or men and women together, naked, naked, tie them up and call it the 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 baptisms of the revolution or the, the the marriages of the revolution to mock the catholic church and then drown them by the thousands throw them in the river with their hands and feet tied they can't swim so thousands were drowned by the the hatred of the, the these masons so the great vendee catholics many of them were just slaughtered just slaughtered, whole villages burnt down and slaughtered and shot. So it's estimated, I think, up to 300,000, if not more, were just massacred. So all these good Catholic people devoted to Mary, imagine what heaven was on those days. Heaven was filled with new, fresh saints from the Vendée who died fighting for the Catholic faith and defending the faith. But it was St. Louis de Montfort who prepared them by devotion to Mary. So he prophesied that his devotion to Mary would spread at the, towards the end of times. And now in most, most Catholic traditional chapels, people pray the rosary before mass. That is now a custom. And in most Catholic families, we kneel down and pray the rosary, or they go for a walk and pray the rosary. Most families do this now, thanks to St. Louis de Montfort and St. Dominic, who preached the rosary. Let me just take, I can't end with a story, without a story, of St. Louis de Montfort, who tells some of the miracles of the rosary. Listen to this, from his great book called The Secret of the Rosary, which again, all you young people should know this book. You should know this book. It's full of uh, powerful testimony of the power of the rosary. <coughs> and the 15 promises that Our Lady gives to those who pray the rosary every day. He says this in the 10th rose, page 30, While St. Dominic was preaching the rosary in Carcassonne, a heretic made fun of the miracles and the 15 mysteries of the Holy Rosary, and this prevented other heretics from being converted. As a punishment, God suffered 15,000 devils to enter the man's body. His parents took him to Father Dominic to be delivered from the evil spirits. St. Dominic started to pray and begged everyone who was there to say the rosary out loud with him. And at each Hail Mary, Our Lady drove 100, and 100 devils out of the heretic's body, and they came out in the form of red-hot coals. <coughs> <clears throat> After he had been delivered, he abjured his former errors. He was converted and joined the Rosary Confraternity. Several of his associates did the same, having been greatly moved by his punishment and by the power of the Holy Rosary. 
Another story, a learned Franciscan, Carthagena, as well as several other authors, say that an extraordinary event took place in 1482. The Venerable James Spranger and other religious of his order were zealously working to reestablish devotion to the Holy Rosary and also to erect the confraternity in the city of Cologne in Germany. Unfortunately, there were two priests who were famous for their preaching ability, who were jealous of the great influence they were exerting through preaching the rosary. So these two fathers spoke against this devotion whenever they had a chance. And as they were very eloquent and had a great reputation, they persuaded many people to not join the confraternity and not pray the rosary. Reminds you of the Vatican too. Uh, many novice ordo uh, modernist priests, they hate the rosary. And in one, one old person told me, when in one sermon, the priest held up a rosary, and, and when the new mass was being introduced, he held up the rosary and he broke it on the pulpit and said, you won't need this anymore because of the new mass. One of these priests, bound and determined to achieve his wicked end, wrote a special sermon against the rosary, and he planned to give the sermon on the following Sunday. But when it came time for the sermon, he never appeared, and after a certain amount of waiting, somebody went to fetch him. The priest was found dead, and evidently had died all alone without anyone to help him and without seeing a priest. After convincing himself that death had been due to natural causes, the other priest decided to carry out his friend's plan and to give a similar sermon on another day. In this way, he hoped to put an end to the confraternity of the rosary. However, when the day came for him to preach, and it was time to give the sermon, God punished him by striking him down with, with paralysis, which deprived him both of the use of his limbs and of his power of speech. So he had a stroke. At last he admitted his sin, and likewise that of his friend, and immediately in his heart of hearts he silently besought Our Lady to help him. <coughs> he promised her that if she would only cure him, he would preach the Holy Rosary with as much zeal as that with which he had formerly fought against it. For this purpose he implored the Virgin Mary to restore his health and his speech which she did. And finding himself instantaneously cured, the priest rose up like another Saul, a persecutor turned defender of the Holy Rosary. He publicly acknowledged his former error and ever after preached the wonders and miracles of the Holy Rosary with great zeal and eloquence. So, this is just one of many, many miracles described in the secret of the rosary. And we have many recent miracles too, like the bombing of Hiroshima. There was one church and the rectory who were not far from where the bomb dropped. Everything was flattened, but this church and rectory stayed intact. And those priests, there were five priests, they all lived a ripe old age to tell the story that it was through the rosary and our, the, the devotion to Our Lady of Fatima and fulfilling her requests that Our Lady spared them. And they didn't die of radiation either. They did they live to a ripe old age. So let's pick up, of course, all most good traditional Catholics. Whenever, you, whenever we meet people who are new to tradition, families who come to tradition, very often, nine out of ten times, it's because they started praying the rosary. And then they realize something's wrong with the Navasordo, or something's wrong with the compromising St. Peter's position, or something's wrong with the new SSPX compromised position, and they wake up. And through the rosary, they realize that we have to go fully to the traditional Catholic faith. And not just the traditional Catholic Mass, but 
our Lord's not schizophrenic. He doesn't just leave the Mass, but He wants us to profess <coughs> the integral Catholic faith. The whole Catholic faith, which means we must hold all the condemnations of the modern errors by the, the popes of the last 400 years. So that means we must be rooted in the integral Catholic faith. So it's a, it's a mockery of the Mass to mix it with Vatican II and, the, and compromise with the new Mass. You just can't mix those two. Catholicism excludes error. Take a balloon. The Catholic faith is like a balloon. All the doctrines all hold together. One beautiful, whole, harmonious body of truths that we must be, be, believe to save our soul. But if you, if one was to take a pin and just, just pop one hole, the whole thing is lost. The whole Catholic faith is lost by compromise. And that's why we can't compromise with error and with the new mass and with Vatican II. As Archbishop Lefebvre held very strong and he warned his sons, don't seek any agreements with modernist Rome until Rome comes back to tradition. And, that, and I return back to the first point. This is why we faithful, we priests, we request of our bishops, we have a right to know where you stand. Please preach the faith publicly, condemn errors publicly, and not in secret and in private. Our Lord told the apostles, go preach to all nations. He didn't say, go preach to families, go preach in the sacristies, go preach to little chapels. No, he said to the whole world, to the whole world. So this is the, the beauty of the Holy Catholic faith, <coughs> is the triumph of the heart of Jesus the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. One of the, and to close, one of the great sayings of <coughs> St. Louis de Montfort was, God comes to us, He came to us through Mary, and we must go to God through Mary. And that is secure. That is the safest and the best way. So after Mass, right after the end of Mass, we will pray the consecration, we'll renew our consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Those who are following on the live stream can follow as well. There is a plenary indulgence to make this consecration. So for all of us, most of us are going to renew it. And for those who have never done it, I encourage you to do it formally. But we will say it after Mass to consecrate ourselves again and anew to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Because through her will come the victory over Satan, over modernism, over the uh, Masonic powers trying to destroy our Catholic Church. She will overthrow it. And through her will come her promised victory. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, Lord. <coughs> o Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, Lord. O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, Lord. And for those who do not have recourse to Thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <coughs>